Welcome to the Dividend Talk Podcast, episode 69. How to read a cash flow statement. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Dividend Talk. Today we're going to talk you through how we look at a cash flow statement maybe pick out some of our red flags and what to look out for. We will look at some of the news of the week and we have some questions from our community. All that and more. See you on the inside. Yo, 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 European DJ. How are you this weekend? Well, uh, alcohol. You, you look, you look like a broken man. I'm, I'm not going to lie. <laughs> well, you know, it's uh, not sure how it's uh, at, at your work, but we are meeting again face to face, and it feels like uh, people haven't seen each other for one and a half years. So we need to make it up in the uh, in the evening events. Yeah, that can be tough. So I feel a little bit still like uh, I'm getting old. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. Nice, nice. You had you had a nice week, is what I'm hearing, and plenty. I say the Agio shares might have gone up a little bit. You've probably drank so much. Uh, yes, yes. I think I have not been doing my uh, early retirement a favor. <laughs> <laughs> let's let's jump right into the news. Have you got anything this week that kind of stuck out for you? Yeah, I think uh, Johnson Johnson did a brilliant, brilliant move. So what they did. <laughs> What they did, right? They put all the talcum, talcum powder settlements um, in, a, in a separate entity. It's called LTL uh, Management, and they 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 submitted it for bankruptcy. <laughs> so you know, I, I have these fucking shares of buyer already for three years about roundup cases, and Johnson Johnson settles this this deal for two billion in a year. They just put all the cases in a in a legal entity. File it for bankruptcy. Uh, the money is in there to settle it, but it protects it from the the mother company. So this is just brilliant. Why can't Bayer do this? And I mentioned, I believe, in one of the earlier shows, like a while back, when when we heard about this idea that Bayer should hire the lawyers, right, the legal team. Yeah. I mean, look at this. Within half a year to a year, full clarity, shareholders protected. And, and of course, this really cruel capitalism, right? Really cruel from that point of view. Yeah. But it's clear. But even even I could argue for some of the patients, it might be uh, clear because you know the money is there. Get it? Yeah. Uh, here, this is it. <laughs> but buyer. So I, I really respect Johnson Johnson for this. Um, of course, it's not morally totally correct, <laughs> I guess. But it's brilliant. I, I think is I think it's a genius idea, I, I, and you're dead right. Buyer need to just sack whoever they have representing them and get these guys because done. They have it done in a flash, and it's it's over with. And and you know what? In six months' time, this law will be forgotten about. Nobody will be talking about this. Whereas in six months' time, we'll still be sitting here saying Monsanto was the stupidest idea anyone has ever come up with, and buying them was even stupider. So. I, I I just hats off to Johnson Johnson. I mean, you told me before the show, and I must have laughed for about five minutes straight. I just thought it was actually brilliant that they had the audacity to do something like that. But as you said, it's it's capitalism at its worst, but at its best as well. Yeah, yeah, I'm a happy shareholder with this. Sorry, yeah, cannot own bank. Uh, how is it? Tobacco stocks for my wife. Uh, she doesn't know about this probably. So I'm a proud Johnson Johnson shareholder. <laughs> and the dividends continue to grow right so aaa balance sheet so what more do that. you want what yeah. more do you want yeah yeah sleep well at night with this one even if they screw up you can still sleep well at night <laughs> that's how you that's how you run a company that is how yeah, you run a company exactly brilliant how about you any news from your side uh, no no real news for me but but this week my little darling company walgreens released their earnings um, which was which was quite good. They did better than expected, largely due to the amount of COVID vaccines that they administrated. I mean, that's not going to continue, but they they blew it out of the park this this quarter. 
some some really good spots with boots again in the uk and their online business is starting to do really well and also the the with village md that partnership is really starting to to pump up i think they're expecting 80 outlets by the end of the year so everything is on track they're doing doing really well so looking forward to the annual report which should be out soon and giving that a read but overall quite happy they, they took another bounce in share price i think today or yesterday when when they released this so yeah they're uh doing quite well for me lately and and do you still consider them to be undervalued or do you think like okay you know they're now kind of back on fair value i think they're close as close to fair value i, I think more so than than undervalued but I, i'm not adding to them anyway I'm, yeah. I'm keeping the shares that i have for the time being but and, and for what did you buy them and where do they trade now I bought um, around just under the 40, around 40 dollars, and they're up about 50 dollars now. Okay, so you have like 20 uh, 20% gain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, nice one, nice one. Yeah, I don't own it. Um, sometimes I'm looking at it because you mentioned uh, it a lot in the past. Somehow I struggled to 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 see to see a lot of value in 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 how you see it. In, in pharmacies and 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 the physical retail space, so it, it just hasn't excited me yet. I guess that's why I'm staying away from it. But from what you say, like from the fundamentals, it looks quite nice. Yeah, yeah. Hey, look, I'm I'm happy enough. CVS is nice. another one that that I like, which are their competitors, mm. but yeah. they they don't increase the dividends, unfortunately, not yet. But mm. yeah. okay. Let's so, go so, to the main topic, yeah, of the yeah, week. Yeah, yeah, we picked a nice easy one this week because I think we're going to run into a busy period. We have earnings mm -hmm. season coming up. Um, so we chose to have a look at the cash flow statement and talk through bits and pieces of it, how we analyze it, and, and maybe some of the red flags that, that me and you both, both look at. Um, so, I, I, look, I think it's important. This is one of the three financial statements We've already spoke about the balance sheet in episode 21, I believe. We'll, we'll link it below. Um, so then there's the income statement, balance sheet, and cash flow statement. So I think it's important to understand all three. And today we will focus on the cash flow statement. Yeah. So. Yeah, and if you think about the three statements, right, maybe for people that are new to this, uh, because we have a lot of new listeners lately, um, you need to see these three statements really in conjunction with each other. Just reading the income statement doesn't tell you a lot about the financial um, I said state of the company, neither if you only look at the balance sheet. So the income statement really answers you the question, are you profitable? Uh, the balance sheet uh, tells you more like, okay, who owe, who owes this company? Yeah, and to who do you own, owe and who owns it? Um, and the cash flow statement really um, uh, tells you, is there just enough cash to run the bus business? Sometimes people are confused between the income statement and the cash flow statement, but you need to look at it from, um, I said, from a salary point of view. You can have a nice uh, uh, income, yeah, uh, here. But if you have, for instance, um, um, a lot of, uh, how you say it, a lot of, so if, if you look at your income and, and you pay taxes and everything and such, it might feel like yeah. uh, you don't get a lot. But then if you get your bonus in and everything on top of that as well, um, your income statement or your income in a given month might look really, really a, a lot, right? But in the end, it is about the cash. And for instance, if you get many bills in the same month, you you still might feel like you, you have a nice income. Yeah. So let's say you earn yeah. a thousand euro per month, but then suddenly you get your gas bills because it's in the winter. And you might actually, um, I said, because of this, actually in the, I said in the minus, but the cash flow, when you really start looking at the cash, that's where you feel the pain when your cash, uh, I said, not cash rates, rich. Yeah. So, and this is really here the difference between the income statement and the cash flow statement. The income statement has a lot of uh, fictional uh, entities on it, and and which may might look uh, look your profit uh, look lower or higher even. Yep. But in the end, you need to pay bills, and this is what the cash flow shows you whether you can pay the bill. So. Yeah, yeah, I, I I like the analogy that I see the cash flow statement as fuel in your car. 
I mean, you need fueling for your car to, to go. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what the cash flow statement tells you. Have you got enough fuel for your car to run? If yeah. if you don't, your car is not going to run or your company is not going to operate as, as expected. So that's yeah. pretty much how, how I view the cash flow statement. And we've both said in the past that we, we both look at cash over earnings mm -hmm. because it is hard to fudge cash. It is it is possible, and we're, and we're, we're going to go yeah. through some mm -hmm. examples of that. But I suppose before we do that, we'll just strip it right back and we'll go back to to the the main parts and we'll we'll talk through some of the, the fundamentals so we, we we've pretty much summarized it down to three main parts of there's three main parts within the cash flow statement so you got cash flow from operations so if you think about this this is your day-to-day -day business uh, expenses so if you're if you're a restaurant you got you need to bring in or you're paying wages you're bringing in your your inventory there's there's all sorts of things like that so it's it's basically day-to-day um most businesses now look at kind of an accrual based accountancy so they don't have to pay or make payments within 30 days or 90 days and and so that would come off the income statement but then we have to make up for that in in the cash flow statement as well so for example if they sold i don't know a pair of sneakers say nike sold a pair of sneakers and they did not get paid for today they're not getting paid for for 90 days that still goes on the income statement and we have to make up we have to make up for that on, on the cash flow statement somewhere so cash flow from operations is, is really important we've also got cash flow from investing activities you can you can hazard a guess as to what that is that's capital that's property that's stock that's any investing activities that the, the company is involved in and then you've got your financing activities and as dividend investors we probably look to this one first and we look at dividends paid to see if it's, it's actually covered um and it's also the payments of debt or equity and, and so on so that's just a kind of quick overview and, and then we might step through each part individually yeah. and, and, and maybe i can um add to that that because we also look at the free cash flow right yeah and maybe good for the for the readers how I look at it, if, if you ask me to look, really scan a, a free cash a cash flow statement in one minute, I do the, the only uh, the only thing. I take the uh, cash flow provided, the cash provided by operations. So that is like when you get from the income statement, you take the, the income, the, what you mentioned, you do all the accruals. So from the first section, after that is done, the result of that is called cash provided by operations. And then I only take the capital spending from the investing activities because mm -hmm. that's the thing you you invest in new a new plant or something like that and you take that you deduct that from the cash provided by operations that's what we call the free cash flow if i had that number i go to the financing activities section and i check if the dividend is lower than the free cash flow because if it's higher that's really a red flag for me as an example so the free cash flow is what most uh, value invest investors look for we often need to calculate it by hand because the free cash flow, uh, according to the uh, uh, gap rules, is not it's not really necessarily provided. Some companies add it themselves, but often you don't see it on the uh, on the yeah. cash flow itself. So you need to calculate it. Is that the first thing you look for on a, on a cash flow statement? Yeah, straight away I go to sure. the cash provided operations. I take my calculator, deduct the. Uh, well, actually, I, usually I don't need a calculator because it's usually like four digits and. Uh, times million then i take the the capex of it and then i look is the dividend covered and i look also at the buybacks because uh, of many companies do buybacks and then i might add it to the dividends to see if both the dividend and the buyback are covered by free cash flow or not that's what i look at yeah on the on the back on the lap, napkin the, the very very first thing i look at is you, you take the net earnings which is obviously on the income mm -hmm. statement that's transferred to the to the balance sheet it's it's probably the very first line of a balance sheet mm -hmm. in most cases and then i look at exactly that same figure you look at the net cash provided by operating activities and if that is lower than my net mm -hmm. income yeah. then i know straight away that this company is losing cash and they're losing cash pretty fast yeah, yeah, yeah. if if that number is negative then I, <laughs> you might as well run away because it, yeah. it, it's pretty bad so i like to see that number pretty pretty big and much bigger than its net earnings at least then yeah. we know that this company is is cash cash rich and they're they're making enough money that there's enough fuel in the tank if i if yeah. i to, to go like that's the very I, first thing i look for okay it's funny because i'm not so strict on that because i know that year over year they play with this for instance in the operating activities what they get from the income statement 
there's a lot of depreciation, specifically when you look at pharma companies, mm. because what pharma companies do when they, uh, for instance, let's say in the biotech, they, when they discover a new molecule, they need to, um, I said, they need to put it as an asset on the balance sheet, let's say, yeah, the, yeah. The, uh, the future potential of this. But then most of the molecules that, that they work on, they never see daylight because it fails. So they're continuously depreciating um, uh, on, the, on, the, on the income statement. So it is really industry specific way how you, how you need to look at it uh, from that point of view. Yeah. And so because depreciation and amortization can have a really big impact, but, but then we go already like be beyond the first minute. Because what you want to see, for instance, is it's okay that there's a lot of depreciation and amortization in a single year, but over time you wouldn't you would like to see that, for instance, the depreciate that the let's say the capex is is in generally more than the depreciation and the amortization. It tells you that the company is more investing. Because if it's the way around that the depreciation and the amortization is much higher than the capex, then the company's most probably Boof, bo boosting their cash flow, yes. the operating yeah. cash flow, mm -hmm. and under investing in their future uh, earnings power. Yeah, but then we are already beyond the minute here, and that's really for me also something that I try to get a feeling for. Are they under investing? Because some companies do that, right? They play with their cash flow to to boost it up, but they're just under investing in in the future. Yeah, but but I I think you're, you're bang on there that. I don't just look at it in, in one isolation. I don't look at one balance, uh, one cash flow statement and say, okay, this number is lower, discredited. Everything is over maybe five or 10 years. And that's that's why I use my fundamental analysis and everything is over over 10 years. Because you can't exactly. really you can't really judge a company on, on one year because anything, I mean, they could make a huge purchase, as you said, or anything can, can do it over one year. But if you start to see a trend over four, mm -hmm. five, six years, that's yeah. when that's when you know that that a, a company's in trouble, um, and we could I haven't looked, but we could probably pick up IBM now, and we could probably see that sort of trend. Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly, yeah. So maybe you have an example of a cash flow statement um, that you would like to to highlight, and maybe some interesting parts that you you noticed. So we 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 have we have two cash flow statements here. We have one uh, for Kimberly Clark and one for Walgreens. And I I just picked Walgreens coincidentally because I spoke about them earlier on. So I, I opened up their their last their last annual report and went straight to the cash flow statement. And it, it I suppose if you look at the key differences be, between them in the very first section, so the cash flow operating activities, you're going to see on Walgreens, you're going to see adjustments to reconcile net earnings to net cash provided by operating activities and that can be fairly confusing what what are they trying to do here they're trying to reconcile their cash flow statement to the net earnings on on the income statement and they have all sorts of fun stuff on here so they've got tax they've got goodwill and um, goodwill is actually quite high on this it's it's two two billion uh, i think i'm looking at they got stock compensation and gain on previously held interest and as you said depreciation and amortization <laughs> i can't even say that word right now but you you get what i'm saying so they, they have all that that fun stuff on it as well as their day-to-day -day stuff their inventories their assets accounts payable and then all that makes up then their total operation activities yeah yeah, and, uh, I said, I think Wal Walgreens from that point of view has also a really interesting uh, cash flow and a uh, cash flow statement. And yeah, like you said, it's good to look into it because, for instance, I looked at into the Kimberly Clark because last year, Kimberly Clark, um, you know, the, the toilet paper uh, producer, mm -hmm. they had massive cash flow, really, really massive, massive cash flow. And if you look at it um, uh, at that time, they had a net income in 2020 of 1.3 billion, let's say. Yeah. In 2021, that's 300 million less. It's 1 billion uh, net income. But they have been playing with their operating working capital. So what's an operating working cap? What is it? It allows you, it's the money you need to run your business actually on a monthly basis. You need money to, to let the, the, the products flow through your company. So what you what they did at that time. And, and that was because the, the world well, went in lockdown, supply uh, um, had a lot of hiccups. So they sold a lot from inventory. 
but you don't then need to pay your suppliers because you have already paid for it earlier, right? Yeah. At the same time, um, uh, you have accounts receivable and accounts payable. So they just didn't pay their uh, suppliers so much. And, and that's also why that went, uh, um, uh, or they didn't need to deduct from it. And the account receivable as as uh, as well. They were really hawkish on getting the money uh, from their customers, right? So in this case, they last year they had a positive Im impact that they kept 490 million in 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 the company. So you add that then to the operating cash. Suddenly, this 1.3 um, uh, billion. If you put on top of that the depreciation of 400 million million because it wasn't a cash event from the income statement plus this 500 almost operating working capital you're talking about more than 2 billion in operating cash flow uh, they spent like 600 million on 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 on, on investments in cap and in, in capital expenditures so you would then think like wow this company is doing well they have like uh, 1.6 billion in in free cash flow 700 million in uh, how i said in dividends, so they still have 900 million left to spend. Remember the 900 million, because then 2021 they had a negative impact of operating working capital because they, of course, had to resupply the inventory and everything, yep. pay their suppliers and everything, of also almost 500. And this led to the fact that the 800, uh, the thousand, and you put the depreciation on top of it, will, will become like 1,000, uh, uh, 1,400,000 minus the operating working capital of 500. You have like around 900 million. Remember, in 2020, they had an operating uh, cash flow of 2.2 billion, and now 900 million, 21. The only difference is the working capital it's a 1 billion difference if you take the 500 positive and then going to 500 negative 1 billion difference now uh, eight, let's say uh, 900 minus 500 capital spending is 400 million left on a dividend of 750 so and um, why am i saying this i know this might be really hard to follow via the podcast sorry for that to the listeners what i'm trying to say is in 2020 you would thought like wow this company like it has a as a payout ratio on, on free cash flow of 30, 40%. They have so much room to grow their dividend. This year, you would be scared because the payout ratio would be like 130%. You would think like, damn, the company cannot uh, meet its ends and it uh, should cut their dividend, uh, the dividend is at risk. But on average, their dividend is uh, uh, decent enough covered over those two years. And that comes really to your point of you need to look into it over the next five years. Let's say generally this company has a high payout ratio. It's a really non-growing business as such. And, and COVID just screwed their um, cash flow statement up. And you see this with many companies. Yeah? And typical responses in a crisis that they, were, that they, they boost up their uh, working capital because then the figures to us as investors, the headline figures, look much, much better if the revenue is declining. Yeah. And and this is just financial engineering, or you could also actually also really wise, yeah, from management. It is it's not like a bad thing. But if you look at a single year, you can really really draw the wrong conclusions as an uh, investor. They they and what's interesting if you go to page twenty two of this uh, and of this um, annual report or the the on Kimberly Clark page ten, it actually says that. They believe that they ha can generate enough cash, or have the capacity to issue short-term and long-term debt to fund working capital payments. So, so they're telling you that they're going to be they're going to have to issue themselves debt to fund that going yeah. forward. And they they put it in black and white. It's on page page twenty two there, which is yeah, and that shows you that this company is not cash rich. Yeah, yeah? because it is uh, it has just a high dividend. Yeah, and many. The company doesn't give you any uh, price appreciation in the stock price. It's effectively debt money. Uh, yeah, the tra trades typically between 100 and 130 or something like that. Uh, but generally, debt money. Uh, so, what 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 do you own it for as an investor? Is then the dividend? Yeah, and and it's it's. I believe it's over time. It is like a 70 or 80 percent um, uh, payout ratio. So there's no room for really growth. Yeah. And and you know what this 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 shows well, it shows me 
pretty much how bad it can be sometimes to rely on metrics you know like investors yeah. dividend investors we, we love metrics earnings per share uh, payout ratios and we, and we rely on lots of these to make our decisions and they can really be skewed so it's really important that they are only used as a starting point but reading an annual report will tell you a lot more and, and particularly just as as i did there just control f working capital you'll find the footnotes yeah. and they will they will tell you they have to tell you what they're doing it might not be easy to interpret but they will they will tell you and it's i, I think that's that's really important yeah it's it's a good point and i think you need to also think about it when you are screening because um how is it if you take and i have this right i have the um the payout ratio in my dividend screener yeah and and what is a what is the issue here sometimes you might have companies at a in a bad year um because of a certain one-off event therefore don't pop up in your screener and and what what might also happen because of this one-off the stock price goes really down and therefore by just having the screener in place you might actually already exclude really interesting undervalued companies so what i've done over time i i need to depend less on my screener because i just know more about stocks like from my from my brains already straight away about what what is this narrative of this company uh, yeah but if you are new to to the investing and you have lots of those criteria in there you might actually specifically at this uh, in the market where everything feels so expensive you might actually not easily find a lot of companies and over time i hope that the listeners if they use screeners they will find those companies understand the story of the stock behind it and then when a company goes down have a bet one year that they recognize that the metric here is not uh they something that they might natu naturally need to look at yeah uh, is there any any other red flags that you typically look for within a cash flow statement uh yeah i also look at the buybacks yeah they also need to put yeah. that on there so if dividends and buybacks are more than a free cash flow um then that's also the case uh for me a red flag I also look at debt debt movements, yeah, um, because for instance, sometimes you can't get it from the income statement whether the income was funded by debt, yeah. But in the um, in the financing activities, you might see sometimes that, for instance, they have been um, really playing with their debt, uh, like like bringing a bringing a payment downwards or something like that. Um, because it might not directly always reflect on the balance sheet. Yeah, yeah. The, the balance sheet gives you the the high narrative, but I'm also sometimes looking really in the in the in the in, in the in the balance sheet. And what you see, for instance, in Kimberly Clark, that they are issuing, uh, uh, for instance, a little bit more debt than than repaying. Yeah. So and that's also important. It means that this is not sustainable. As an example, if you if you issue more debt than that you repay yeah yeah eventually eventually we'll run out of money yeah um i suppose w one other thing i look for is and um, we know we spoke about the capital spending i like to look at that over maybe five ten years because usually capital spending is going to involve maybe big purchases you're going to be looking yeah. at plant or you're going to be looking at inventory large inventory maybe machinery yeah. or, or, or think so about on. intel yes exactly so I mean, it, sometimes it's good that they do that, but over a long period. So if I take over ten years, if if you have a company that's consistently over, say, a hundred percent in terms of that compared to their net income or net earnings, not, then to me that's a red flag because th that money has to come from somewhere and that has to yeah. come from debt. And I think yeah, yeah. General Motors, if I remember, um, and I should have brought their report up, but I, I think for a long time they were up around nine hundred sixty percent. Um, while still paying out huge dividends and it kind of confuses investors because investors look at it and say oh look we're, we're getting this increase in dividend they have loads of money but really they're, they're getting this from somewhere and it's it's more than likely it's going to be loans or, or something linked to that so it's 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 one of the things that I, I look for as well just to make sure that they are not getting that money getting that money through through loans or bad debt yeah good i'm afraid that we might lost have lost uh, some you uh, some listeners here to this uh we, we don't really use visuals when you're listening on spotify 
So feel free to follow up with any questions. Um, but just a general recommendation from me would be like, make yourself familiar a little bit with the, th with the three financial statements. Um, uh, you heard a little bit like how we look at it. Maybe there are other people also that look at other things. So feel free to share it with us. We are always open to learn things. Yeah. But yeah, it's good to to hear you also a little bit like how you to, how you look at the free cash flow statement. And I might look a little bit more often about is the income, for instance, uh, uh, higher than the um, I said the cash flow or the operating uh, cash flow or the yeah. other way around. Yeah, a good one. I have to, I have to say, and I know I've spoke about this book before, but uh, Warren Buffett's Warren Buffett and the interpretation of financial statements is a, is a really really good book, and it breaks everything down really really simple, and he covers topics like that in there as well. So I I recommend anyone starting now grab that book, and it will um, set you on the right path. Cool. So maybe uh, it's time to go to the listeners' questions then, and then to close the main topic. Uh, by the way, we don't have a portfolio today. We forgot to ask about it. But if you're interesting, interested to have us uh, uh, give our thoughts about your top five of the of your dividend portfolio, feel free to submit it via Facebook or via Twitter, and we will take it on on the next show. Um, but yeah, let's go today to some of the listeners' questions. Okay, um, let's start uh, in order. Let's go with Sego Investor. And he has asked us about our thoughts on FB, which I assume is Facebook. Yeah, um, I own Facebook. I own it since, uh, I don't know, $150. Um, it might be an opportunity to buy. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I, I don't own him. My son has him. He's, he's 11 years old and... He he's told me the other day he wants to buy more, so yeah, I'll, uh, I I believe him. But I, I mean, all all this news is driving. I mean, it's probably going to hold our share price down, but there's no denying that they are a money making machine. So well, same with Cambridge Analytica. Um, I said such a nar narrative passes away again. You see it already a little bit with Baba. I don't hear yeah. too many people this week talking about Baba or the week before. Uh, it's been a bit more quiet around China. I expect the same for Facebook. So I think it will quickly uh, go back again uh, once this blows over um, because this is not something that has a material impact from the whistleblower. Yeah, Unless they really start putting regulation, but we know how slow that goes in politics. The only thing that I look at for Facebook where I have a concern is the impact of uh, the Apple and their policy. That's the only thing. Yeah, And this is where I would like to see in the upcoming quarterly earnings, what is the impact? Is there already financial impact uh, visible here? If not, uh, then then it's it's even more of a buy for me because I think the shares are fairly valued around uh, to towards the four hundred, mm. and it's now in the in the three hundred thirty or something like that. So it's way too grow. Cool. Um, Dividend newbie has asked us how do we see the German election impacting the European economy and stock market in the upcoming years? Uh, I don't know usually and and he did mention beforehand usually germany are the cornerstone of the eu and what happens their economy trickles down to to the eu so i mean i don't know maybe phil maybe phil might have a better better answer there yeah. i don't know i know there was elections on i don't know how it panned out or, or what the results are what that even means yeah. um but maybe phil is maybe a little bit more closer and, and could give a, a better answer yeah. than i could well, we spoke about it a little bit early uh, in one of the two shows ago. I think maybe with Dividend Day we spoke about it. But look, the, this this election has been really important because Germany, whether we like it or not, is the engine of Europe. Yeah, it's 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 the engine, the cash flow statement of Europe. So um, whatever happens there might have really an impact. But the thing is here that is it's just too early for me to say i wouldn't i would really need to see the plans of uh of the, of the new parliament what they really are going to do and based on that we can get a feeling there and um i'm also really interested in their inflation numbers in germany i think there was something released the other day which was really high and and yeah so i, I think it still needs one or two weeks or three weeks for me to 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 that the, the, the politicians settle down there and then i think we get more clarity 
Yeah. At least I don't hope it will be a protectionist, uh, I said, uh, government, because I think that would be damaging at this moment in time. Cool. Um, so Kurt has asked us, um, he is looking, he's under invested in tech companies and he is looking to buy Uber. He believes the momentum is shifting positive and they are becoming profitable in the coming quarters. Please, your opinion. I mean, I think that last sentence uh, says it all for me. The momentum is shifting positive and they are becoming profitable. They're not profitable at the moment. It's not the type of company I'm comfortable investing in. I don't, I don't even believe they pay a dividend. So I like mature companies that we can go over 10 years of reports. And as, as we said, we can see that they are generating cash, generating earnings. This is not my circle of competence. Um, listening to guys on Twitter, it seems like it could be a good bet, but maybe someone like Investment Talk or someone with a bit more value or growth mind would be able to answer that a little bit better. But you know, um, a stock is not a business necessarily, or a good business isn't necessarily a good stock. But do you believe it's a good business? Because I tell you, I was using, I started using Uber again uh, lately. But then I hear the news like um, that they need to, that the Uber drivers need to get a license in some countries and such. And I wonder if this is not like like just killing their business model, really. Yeah, because they have been they've been earning over the back of uh, cheap labor, effectively yeah. by not having employees, uh, out competing uh, therefore the normal taxi business, let's say in the cities. But I really wonder if it's uh, if it's if it's a good business model. Yeah, I mean, how long does Uber exist already? And if it's still not profitable? Yeah, I think you're looking more at the autonomous route, aren't you? Once it goes autonomous, they don't need employees and then it can become profitable. The cars will drive yeah. themselves. Okay, but then I would put my whole bet on Tesla. Look at, uh, look at the data Tesla has been collecting over all the years about uh, about driving, Yeah, the, the miles and the meters. and Yeah. Yeah, but Tesla are in a different space. They're not going to pick people up and ferry them around at the moment. Well, maybe they will in the future, but maybe they will. Maybe they will. Uh, investors on Twitter talk about optionality and uh, arc investment as well. So anyway, uh, I, I don't, I don't see it as a good business. So that's why I stay away from Uber. And then I don't even need to look into the, in, in, into the financial statements. Okay. Um, Nick Scott has asked you a question and he said, after bad mounting, John Stinky, and that name kills me every time. After Pat and John Stanky, what would it take for you to invest in T? So an AT&T. Um, yeah. I wouldn't invest in it for dividends. Let's be clear then. It's, it's like uh, that for me, this stock. Okay. But I also have my 10% value investing uh, part. So if this company, for instance, would trade at a price that that justifies just already the communications business and you would get discovery for free that might become interesting i haven't done my homework i know they trade somewhere in the 25 dollars at the moment um, but let's say a hypothetical uh, story if if the communications business would be worth 20 dollars the and and the stock would start trading there i could invest in at&t because even then after the dividend cut we probably still have a 5% dividend yield or something like that. And then you get the discovery shares for free. But then I look at it from a value play, not from a dividend uh, investment point of view. And as a, as a value investor, I'm always considering every stock, uh, even General Electric or Tupperware. And I missed out on Tupperware because I think it was trading for $1 or something like that. Yeah. And now what is it? at 20? Oh. Yeah, it was during the financial uh, during the the lockdown. This this if you bought then, you you made one of the best deals. Uh, forget about Neo and all those EVs. If you bought Tupperware, then you you, you really really made a big big money. It was really trading at at one sixty two, and it went as high as thirty five dollars after that. Yeah, so think about the returns there. Tupperware, plastic boxes. <laughs> So, so what you're saying is we're going to get trending on Twitter, T under twenty. That's that's the new that's the new T trend. T under twenty, yeah, yeah. No, but I, I look at it like that, uh, uh, Nick. If you're listening, um, I think from a value investment point of view, every stock could be at a certain moment uh, interesting. Also, AT and T, 
Um, and I don't have an allergy like uh, I have with IBM or our banks. So it's just the CEO. <laughs> and if the CEO is gone, it uh, might make it even more interesting. Good. Okay. Um, scoreboard investor has asked us, okay, he said he saw a thought experiment about Buffett's dividend yield for Coca-Cola, ticker KO, based off his cost basis from shares purchased years ago. Do you ever calculate yield based off cost basis or solely off current share price? Um, I actually, I, I, I have this definitely yield on cost because when I invest, I'm actually often calculating how, how many years would it take me to get to 10% on, on this money that I'm deploying in the market now, because that getting to 10% is really where you see the, the impact of compounding. Uh, so I often check, like, okay, it's now 3% yield. If it grows this much, it will take 15 years to get to 10% yield on cost. So yes, I have a row uh, or a column in my G sheet where yield on cost is very present. And it allows me also to, to trace back whether I'm on track to go to the 10% as an example and, and to see where I'm, now, where I'm now. Because if I see that not a lot moved there, probably I was... I said overestimating the amount of dividend growth for, for the companies. Yeah. So I, if I calculate with 6% and they are just growing with two or 3%, I need to learn from that. Right. Because yeah. then I made the wrong assumptions. Oh, very good. I, I have a field in my, my spreadsheet with yield on cost, but I don't use it anyway, near as eloquently as you have described it's, it's just there as, as a as a figure for me but maybe it's a good idea to take some learnings from that that's a good answer yeah hey the 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 question then from cuts to he is asking um do you consider the allocation you may have in other investments when determining your sector allocation of your dividend growth investment portfolio for if, ex yeah yeah if 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 i did I would not have nearly 50% in consumer staples at the moment. Um, I mean, I look, I mean, I'm in the accumulation phase and, and yes, it's, it's not pretty to look at And I know it's, it's overweight in one sector, but that's where I see the value at the moment. So I just buy what I, what I see. Yeah. Good. Super. Um, then one of the last questions or the last question from today is from Davide and, um, he asked last week a question about Vodafone and uh, uh, he now asks uh, about the following. So he was wondering, considering our basic expenses, what is the target amount that we are trying to hit in order to consider yourself financially free? I am looking at 100% of expenses of yeah. of bills that i that i have to pay not not discretionary not me going out to the pub with my mates that's i don't need that it's it's what i need to to live on without having to pay another without having to worry about paying bills that's what i yeah. consider myself financially free yeah i have the same and um, i know now what my expenses are and that includes um i said uh drinks entertainment vacations everything you have one-off costs you have uh, like once a year costs you have monthly costs um so i look at it more like at the, on a yearly basis because then you have also the the yearly cost like for instance your car insurance which i pay once a year so and that needs to be covered and that's a uh, that's a approximately currently 50 percent of my uh, uh salary and i need to i need to have that covered by dividends Plus 20% margin of safety is something I might uh, uh, strive for. Okay. Very good. Good. So with that, we are to the end of the show, um, uh, EMF. Thank you so much for this week. Uh, once again, for the listeners, I hope the cash flow topic was not too, too difficult to follow. Um, it's a bit difficult without visuals, but we thought that it's really important to pick up a little bit our conversations about financial statements, particularly for the people that are listening already a bit longer. Yeah, yeah, and, and I, I echo that. It, it is it was quite hard to do this without visuals. As I said, I, I recommended that book earlier from Warren Buffett, and just read some statements, ask us some questions if you want, drop it on Facebook, we're always on Facebook, Twitter, send us an email. Uh, maybe send it to our personal emails because we're not too good at checking the, the dividend talk email. Um, but we would we'll be happy to answer any questions you have. Um, and with that, we will see you all next week, hopefully.